beware the court of owls that watches all the time, ruling Gotham from a shadowed perch behind granite and lime. They watch you at your hearth. They watch you in your bed. Speak not a whispered word about them, or they'll send a talon for your head. The mythology of the Court of Owls came about because I knew that I really wanted to do a story that would ha that would involve the city's history. And so one of the things that I've always loved about Batman and the things that I've loved about the stories that have inspired me the most, like Dark Knight Returns or Year One or The Killing Joke with Gotham Central, so many of the Batman stories that kept me involved in comics over the years really in it sort of focus on Gotham as a character. Like Year One, for example, or Dark Knight Returns. They made Batman real because the city that he was fighting in, Gotham, felt like an extension of New York City. It was something that, in Year One, had gangs and violence and drugs. It looked real to me. Or in Dark Knight Returns, even though it's something that was futuristic, the problems that were suddenly larger than life, like the mutants and this kind of bizarre, oppressive, computer Reagan, Cold War mentality, all of those things were things you were afraid of as a kid in the city, this sense of what if there's nuclear war or gang violence. There's a humility that comes with living in a city that's as old as New York. Um, and a sense of, I'm here for a short time on the planet in the city and there will be people here after me as there were people here before me. And what Scott did, which was great, is he didn't invent something new. He invented something old. This is now something that goes back hundreds of years. So everything you thought you knew has been changed in your present day. And that's the beauty of it. Bruce Wayne, he knows the city back to front better than anybody. He knows the neighborhoods, he knows the criminals, he knows the informants, he knows everything. But the one thing, if you've grown up in a city or you've lived in a city, you know that well, is always going to remain enigmatic to you is that sense of, of history. One way to look at these great fantasy stories is that they are reflections of our own inward life. When you see the mythology arising out of the Court of Owls beginning in the 1600s, you see the emerging mythology of Batman in our time. What you're watching is a constant in the human imagination. There's a constant of fear, terror, and a desire for revenge on one hand with the Court of Owls. On the other hand, there is the constant need for self-redemption and for justice. Gotham is a completely unfolding, compelling mystery. We never know the complete story. And so if, it, my feeling was if we could create a, a villain that would almost be a weaponized version of the city's history itself, we could really threaten Bruce. Secret societies go hand in hand with conspiracy theories. From the Illuminati to the Freemasons, History has proven that these organizations shroud themselves in mystery. The Court of Owls are anchored in this dark tradition. From behind the thin veil, the court is able to pull the strings and manipulate a more direct agenda for Gotham. The Court of Owls for me, they weren't really based on any real people so much as this sense of, I think, conspiracy. From the Middle Ages on, we have secret societies that are believed to exist in castles, in monasteries, in the old churches. There's a deepening, deepening belief in the cabals of political courts around the world. They use people's own superstitions against them. The court is hiding amongst you. The court is always around because 
there where you least expect them. They're, they're right next to you. So you could be working with someone who's part of the court. They could be hiding in your building. They could be running your company. They could be the minister of your church. The, the concept of the court is that they can be anywhere and anything and hiding in plain sight. In modern times, there's a, a real terror of the loss of our individualism, the loss of the control of our own fate and destiny with the increasing news, the increasing knowledge of how our lives are being determined. I think we like to imagine that we're in control of our lives, and in reality, we're not in control of anything. And I think, uh, for me, that plays upon the fears that I'm just a puppet on somebody's string, and I think to some degree we all are. And so I think, uh, you know, just because we're all, we all are aware of that, we all feel that, it's just, it's uh, good writing material. There are malevolent forces that we can't see, secret forces that are actually determining our lives. The Court of Owls was largely that, the sense of a city that's secretly behind the city, this kind of invisible hand that's moving things in the city without Batman really being aware of it. Another component to the secret society is the need for an icon. Symbols have great power. They can instill hope, fear, or in this case, a deeper sense of mystery. The Freemasons use the symbol of God represented by the letter G, along with a square and compass indicating their connection to the roots of building and development, both literally and in the spiritual sense. The Illuminati make use of the all-seeing eye in the center of the pyramid. In a similar tradition, the Court of Owls also maintains its own symbol, that of the owl a mythic beast that has great power and is symbolic of many things depending upon the period of history or people from which it is represented. It's the animal of the night, it's the animal of the dark. Sometimes it's called the eagle of the night. It can see at night, watching us from a long, long distance away, maybe eternity, watching us from the subterranean world. The fascination with owls for me and Greg was really, can we create something that's based on a kind of natural order that is predatory, that would eat a bat in about five minutes, and that would snatch it out of the sky and tear it apart? And that became, yes, the owl would do that. Looking up owls, the, the, the sort of natural behavior that they exhibit is so scary so much at the time. The fact that they're so hidden and so vicious and so invisible, they just seem perfect. It is both malevolent and benevolent. It represents both wisdom and terror of death and doom. To use this as the iconography in the court is triggering an archetypal truth. And by that I mean the archetype is the symbol that needs no language. It is immediately signifying something of great power. You don't have to have italics and subtitles underneath an owl. There is something deep within our DNA that immediately responds to it. We wanted it to be freighted with a lot of different possibilities in the story. One of the things that was exciting to me was when I look back at different sort of elements of how it's been interpreted in different cultures and folklore, one of the things that it seemed to stand for was a connection to death and the afterlife to be a, a sort of shepherd into an underworld, which I felt was perfect for this sense of history and the sense of the crushing weight of the dead. Mythologies in the Choctaw Indian mythology, for example, the hooting of the owl presages a child dying in the night. Now that would strike terror in your heart, right? In another Indian mythology, the hooting of the owl suggests that the owl is going to swoop down and steal your children. So there is a fear, there is a deep-seated fear here of this owl. But also a sense of wealth and power. Part of the fun of the story, at least in the comics, had to do with the idea of the owl being on the Athenian coin. We like to place our lives into a form of order. We rely upon knowing that we can organize ourselves by class or by culture or by knowing that a particular group makes laws. The secret society threatens that notion as they manipulate the agenda from behind the scenes. 
The Court of Owls emerges into the world of Batman and challenges the known history of the city and how Bruce Wayne's family may not have been the only ones involved in Gotham's founding and early construction. It is a terrifying notion to think that a group obscured in the shadows has controlled Gotham since its inception. The rise of power, the rise of privilege throughout history has exacted a price. They have this kind of inertia to them throughout history where all of the sort of wealthy and powerful families have either involved themselves with the court or paid the court off or, you know, paid some kind of tribute to the court so that the court would leave them alone and, and sort of allow them to be part of the machinations of Gotham's sociopolitical history. The court has had a lot more uh, impact on the city than Bruce ever suspected. There's a moment in the story where he doubts himself. He doubts everything he knew or thought about Gotham. And I think that's one of the things that the Court of Owls depends on. It does make people doubt because they are there operating in secret. So who actually comes up the winner, who controlled Gotham, is the uh, enduring mystery. That's nothing that's been answered yet. And so it's anybody's guess. I mean, they certainly have the power, the money, and the influence. It's very much like a lot of our political organizations and, and certain things that influence our elections and, and influence you know, local politics and things like that. They're involved in every facet of life in Gotham City. And the Court of Owls then is setting up a version of their mythology of Gotham City, which they believe is superior to that of those who are wealthy, those who have power and money. There are people who you don't even know are a part of the court who are controlling things in Gotham. So they're, they're really a, a secret Illuminati type organization. So for us, the scary thing was not just that they would look terrifying or that their masks would be frightening or the talons would be violent and scary, but that the real fear would come from the sense of them having been active for decades and decades and decades. A secret society must hide, but this is no easy task. How can an organization live in the shadows of a city and be invisible over 400 years? The Court of Owls was mindful of their need to be obscure. The idea was to live among the inhabitants of the city without drawing attention. Through alcoves, secret floors and buildings, and hidden dwellings, the Court of Owls could effectively retreat to the shadows while they watched and listened carefully to the city as it grew and evolved. The challenge writing The Court of Owls was to create an organization that you would believe as a reader, as a viewer, really had had a hand in shaping Gotham both architecturally and, and on a kind of socio-political level. And so for us, it became about really trying to create a sense of the court being present in the visual representation of the city. That they felt part of the dusty, limestone, you know, cement history of Gotham. The fact that their hiding places are on the 13th floors of all the buildings throughout Gotham. Well, the 13th floor is, is supposedly notoriously bad luck. Like, buildings aren't supposed to have 13th floors because of that reason. That they are putting strongholds in Wayne buildings is a way of basically saying to the Wayne family, we are actually in control. You may not know it, but we are actually controlling every aspect of, of Gotham in the shadows, as owls do. An owl can remain invisible from human sight, you know, in a tree, by its own camouflage and its own stillness. That is something that's kind of terrifying to, to Bruce, I think, in a real way. Because everything that he, he prides himself on as Batman has to do with this idea that nobody knows the city better than him. He, there's no nook or cranny that he hasn't explored, no villain he doesn't know. And so not only for there to be a villain that he doesn't know, but a villain that, that's been there for years and has such an extensive reach, that's something that we felt would be really terrifying for him. The actual physical court of owls is another example of how deeply rooted the mythology is to what we know from antiquity. The location is mysterious and foreboding and designed to torture and capture those that threatened its secret or existence. 
The labyrinthine structure is the perfect trap to inflict a manipulation of all the senses of mind and body. Not even the greatest of detectives in Batman can escape the potency of the horror that the Court of Owls can inflict. Once again, we have a really tantalizing image of mirroring. Bruce Wayne has secreted himself away in a very gothic horror-like mansion. And it's echoed, it's mirrored in the hideaways of the Court of Owls. The Labyrinth and the Court of Owls it, it is, in a lot of ways, it, it, it's very much akin to the Ro Roman Forum or the Colosseum. It's a statement of power. It's a statement to whoever who stumbles in there that they're in a different world, that there is a secret world that is actually controlling you. I mean, the Labyrinth, uh, most people who go in don't come out. They die there. They lose their sanity before they're taken out by a town, murdered, and their face put up on a wall. You know what I mean? So. Uh, I think because it's so difficult to navigate in that environment, and you're being drugged and led around different corridors, lights are on, lights are off, all this different kind of stuff, it's, 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 it's a metaphor for them. I mean, they're elusive. Uh, you can't find them, you can't touch them. The closest analogy that I can think of are those marvelous and haunting sketches by the 18th century artist and engraver Peronisi. His images of prisons and castles helped spark the entire Gothic revival. That's one of the greatest scenes in, in, in the story where Batman stumbles and sees the great Gotham statue because it is this totem of power that he didn't know nothing about. And But to the court, it is very important. It is basically a statement to anyone who finds himself in that area, we are in control. Much akin to any empire or, or any power base, they set a totem up that says, you're nothing and we are everything. And that moment, I think, was very key in the Batman story. The evil of Gotham is actually part of Gotham and, and part of what built Gotham. It goes back to one of the more compelling aspects of the story is that Batman doesn't know everything about Gotham. By that virtue, you know, I had things early back from, you know, World War I era, you know, all the way up to modern era, so all these little nests, roosts, as you were, were all decked out in different ways. The architecture sort of clashes with itself. The buildings are representative of, of warring forces, you know, that, that modernity and, and history and commercialism and, you know, personal interest, the people that live in the building. There's always a sense of kind of the haunted quality of those streets, you know, that generations of people have lived there before you and have gone through things that you're going through and also things that you'll never go through. Gotham itself is evil because the Owls helped create Gotham. So it, it makes Batman question his whole mission about what is he actually protecting when he's protecting Gotham. If the Owls are a part of every building, who does he trust? Because there could be Owls who are part of the police department. Uh, some of his closest allies could be Owls. What's delicious about this emerging mythology of the Court of Owls is that they are pretending to want to transform Gotham City into something good. And that this will be good for the citizens of Gotham. The minute you are in the mythology of pretending, you need a mask. You need some kind of camouflage because the true intention is actually about power and greed and money and often destruction. In order to signal that, then you change your costume. You have to hide your true intentions. That's what we see in a single image of the Mask of the Owl. The inner nature of a man revealed through a mask upon his face. The Court of Owls hides behind their physical masks to further conceal their deep secret as Gotham's mythic court of influence but there is a haunted angle to their mask, as they are emblematic of fear and the depth of man's darkest visions. Everyone fears the unknown, and I think that's one of the things the Court of Owls really represents. They're at once very anonymous. They need to be anonymous. They need to be this sense of uh, this kind of enigmatic, removed, almost singular force in the city, because Batman if he knew who everybody was that was in the court, they'd become less scary. They're in essence faceless. They all wear masks, even the children 
uh, who are part of it wear masks. So the idea is that there isn't one head. Very often in mythology, you have a twinning phenomenon going on. Batman is famous not just for his courage and his anti-heroic behavior, he's famous for his mask. He's a man who is masked, but for a benevolent reason. But the malevolent side of the mask is that you are deliberately striking terror in the hearts of the innocent. So the mask is a very curious notion. It can be numinous, it can be an echo of something divine, but it can also hide evil intentions. And that's the difference between Batman and the Court of Owls. There's a sense of kind of communal anonymity, I think, in it in a way that's supposed to be spooky, whereby they understand that they control the city and that the people that don't know who they are are the people that are subjected to their will. So it's almost a show of power. They wear this mask to say, we are anonymous to the people that feel our influence, but to each other, you know, we are known. The design of the mask itself Greg, it was funny, I, I, I had an idea for one that was a little bit more elaborate, and when Greg showed me this one that was more blank and more, um, I think, almost sort of ghostly, it was perfect. I saw it and I was like, you're right, simpler is better. They were owls, but they were actually something, when you look at them, they were very, very frightening. Scott also comes from a like horror background, and he actually sent me a picture of a particular owl a very white-faced, plain owl that had a very long nose and a beak, and I just made a mask out of that. You know, I think those kind of things are very scary, like when you have, you know, like Jason uh, on Friday the 13th, you know, just the hockey mask, or, you know, you have Halloween, which is, you know, a featureless mask, you don't really see the eyes. You know, that kind of gives you an uneasy feeling. There is one wonderful notion of the etymology of the word mask that goes back to an old Spanish word that means the second face or the other face. The word persona from the Greeks means mask, it means face as well. And it, all this suggests that we can wear more than one face, we can offer more than one face to the world. But there is a choice to either use it malevolently or benevolently. The Wayne family was once known as the architects of Gotham. They are and have been the most influential family among the elite. Much to the surprise of Bruce Wayne is the fact that his family has never been alone in their decisions. The conspiracy of the Court of Owls weighs upon the mind of Batman as he comes to learn of the possibility that the court may have been behind the murder of Thomas and Martha Wayne so many years ago. The Waynes and their conflict with the Owls is basically a philosophical one. The, the Waynes have never towed the line. They've been uh, philanthropic, they've been altruistic, they've been all these things. They truly want what's good for Gotham. They always have, even before Bruce Wayne showed up, Thomas Wayne was like that, Alan Wayne was like that. And the schism is that the Court of Owls, again, wants things their way. They've always had this kind of iron grip on the city where children would, would recite this kind of poem about them and, and adults, you know, pretended they weren't real but deep down knew maybe they were. So when Bruce comes along and becomes Batman, it really sort of startles them and, and I think throws them off. They claim to want what's best for Gotham, but what they ultimately want is control. And so true humanitarians like the Waynes get in their way and they have to be eliminated. Obviously, young Bruce Wayne thought the Court of Owls, if they did exist, had to be behind his, his uh, parents' death. And in the story, it's, it's very clear in a way that, like many people who have survived a tragedy, Bruce, as a young kid, was trying to make uh, logic out of a tragic situation. There's this you know, rich mythology of the Owls, starting with um, an owl being president at when the Waynes are murdered. Um, that's the first thing Bruce Wayne sees after his parents are murdered. And so it adds an element to the Batman mythology that, wait a minute, there's something else going on here. I mean, anything's possible now that we're learning about their existence and their power and their influence. And, and Joe Chill, we haven't confirmed that he's the actual killer of Bruce's 
uh, parents. So let's just put that on record. It's not proven Joe Chill may or may not be the killer. Whether the court was behind it or not, I don't know. It seems to be that Joe Chill was, um, and that's something Batman has to deal with, that his parents' death may have just come out of left field, and that is something that drives him every day. But the court's existence now drives him in a different direction. And so anything they can do to prove to Bruce or to Batman that not only are they more powerful than him, but that they, their reach kind of can extend right into his own household and that they can pull anybody from his life uh, that matters to him into their own clutches is something that they're going to want to do. There is a long tradition within secret societies where the youth is targeted and brought in as the new recruits. From the very ranks of the members, their children are often forced into becoming the new leadership. The Court of Owls, in a sinister twist on this mythology, captures children and forces them into their ranks. One of the more hideous aspects of, of what the court did, and I think one of the most fascinating things in the story, was that for years they would take children and train them to be actually talons, and generation by generation, the new talon would kill or uh, de de defeat the old talon. Gangs will go after people when they're young. The mob goes after people when they're young. They want to indoctrinate people that are still susceptible to a lot of the things that they have to offer, the sense of power or empowerment, the sense of purpose. And so the court, one of the things that I think speaks to how evil they are is the fact that they'll go after children to be their assassins, you know, that they'll, they'll raise them to be their weapons. After reading the Court of Owls story, we realized we could tie it into the story we're telling uh, on our end with Damien. Talon uh, represents kind of a surrogate father figure to Damien because at the time that he meets Talon, Damien and Batman are at odds because Damien wants his rightful legacy. He wants to be called Damien Wayne publicly. Batman's holding him at bay. He's not quite uh, a letting the world know that Damien Wayne is Bruce Wayne's son. So part of the fun of constructing the story uh, in the comic and some of the stuff that I think you know is adapted into the film is this notion that the mystery around the Court of Owls begins very far away from Bruce. It begins with this notion that Batman doesn't really believe that they exist and that they are part of the city's mythology. And then he realizes, yes, they are part of the city's mythology. And then he realizes not only are they part of the city's mythology, but they're closer to me than I thought in the way that they involve, you know, they're after Robin, they had designs on Dick Grayson. And so it's almost like a mystery that was right under his nose. The Court of Owls represents on one side a new enemy for Batman. But on a deeper malevolent perspective, the court is far more reaching as an enemy of all of Gotham. Although mystery and conspiracy help give birth and sustenance to the Court of Owls, it is the notion of raw power that keeps their agenda hidden and immortal. When a mythology is deeply connected as the Court of Owls is to the myths of antiquity and the symbol of the owl, we get the longevity of one of Batman's most sinister forces to date. And I think that's one of the things the Court of Owls really represents. They were in many ways, just a fairy tale. And Batman clearly thought they were just a fairy tale. And one of the things that happens when you find out a fairy tale or you find out a nightmare, for instance, is real, that's very compelling. That's very, your, your sense of reality somehow shifts. The Swiss psychologist Carl Jung said something very interesting along these lines years ago where he said, the repressed God becomes a demon. The forces that aren't visible that are repressed into the corridors of power in the suspicion of modern government becomes monsters. And this is what Bruce Wayne is up against. For me, the greatest thrill was to get to create a new enemy for Batman. I mean, growing up, those rogues, Joker, Penguin, Two-Face, they're my favorite characters, not just in comics, but in literature, because they're all extensions of Batman's fear. So for us, the challenge really was to make something that, that would speak to, to one of Bruce's deep-seated 
uh, paranoias about his own failings. I think what all this is suggesting is a huge collision between the myth of the individual that is starting to rise and the myth of the collective. And when we begin to hint at some interference, powers in government, powers in churches, powers in a castle, powers in a monastery, powers in the court of owls, we begin to become paranoid. And this is what Bruce Wayne is up against. He's up against the resentment, the powers of the court of owls who have decided to slay him.